What is up, Thrive? It is great being back together with you on our online service. Obviously, we had some technical issues last week, but we have an incredible team that worked really hard to get things worked out so that today we can bring our service to you and are excited to do so. I have to tell you, I'm really proud of the teams that are working, our worship team, our production team, our video team, that are really working tirelessly to be able to provide an opportunity for us to gather together as the church. This is an unusual and yet still strategic opportunity for us, and we're still gathering, whether it's in homes all over our area. We want to thank you for being with us. If you're new or you've never tuned in before, we want to just say welcome to Thrive. We're glad that you are with us. Now, last week, we actually kicked off a series called Flip the Script, and the idea behind it is this. There's a lot of scripts that we follow and direct our lives, and sometimes we start following a negative script, a script that we don't intend to follow that doesn't have great consequences for us, and there are times and needs that we have to flip that script and to follow something totally different, and what we discover is that Jesus truly is the one to help us flip that script and begin following a different story, a better story, one that is directed by God himself. Now, last week when we kicked it off, we talked about how do we flip the script on uncertainty. Now, uncertainty is something that every single one of us is feeling right now. The difference is, is that uncertainty driving you to places where you're a little bit on sandy ground and you're getting a little bit caught up in things, or are you standing on the rock and allowing Jesus to be the builder of your life? See, where you choose to build makes all the difference. If you weren't able to tune in, we'd encourage you to go check out uh, our website or our YouTube channel to be able to follow that message and get caught up because it's one that I know will encourage you in these times that we are in. And that's just one beginning to this series that we started. And today we have another area in our lives that we're going to flip the script. One that I think is coming out of a little bit of some observation in our culture right now. And it really is something though, not just what we're going through, but really permeates our lives sometimes all the time. And we're going to flip the script on being served. Now I want to take you back to 2017. I had the opportunity with our church to lead a team down to El Salvador. We were going down to build a clean water well. Now, going into this trip, we were excited. We couldn't wait to get down there and and to bless this community by helping them actually have clean water for the first time. And when we landed in country, there was a a group uh, that was directing us and leading us uh, on the team, and they took us out to the village uh, that we were going to be working in, and they sort of set the expectation for us before we got there, saying, hey... uh, They're going to give you lunch every day. Uh, There's going to be some people that are going to be helping you work. Um, Sometimes they'll do more. Sometimes they're just trying to get by because it's just in a very poor area. So they were trying to just kind of give us some expectations of what we were going to experience. And when we drove up, the rest of that week radically changed just because of how we were treated that entire week. From the moment that we drove up down this dirt road, out in the middle of nowhere, seemingly, There was this huge throng of people that were there. The school turned out to meet us that day and all these kids. And that literally set the tone for we thought we were going in there and trying to bless them. But they totally turned things around and they were serving us all week long. And what's incredible is when you looked at the conditions that they lived in and they were from. This was one of the houses that was one of the leaders of the community that he lived in. And this is a a house that literally was just some corrugated metal. Uh, and some chicken wire for a fence. And this is where we had lunch every day. It was their dining room that you literally could sit down and it's this outdoor kitchen that we were wondering what it would look like and what it would mean for us. This is where we were at every day. And this is the conditions upon which they're, they're living on a daily basis. And yet every single day, they are loving us. And they're bringing us Uh, snacks in the middle of the day. They're bringing us uh, just incredible lunches, going out of their way for their time, their resources, beyond what they should have done. They literally were blessing us and serving us. And I have to tell you, it was one of those moments that you won't ever forget. Because you walked away from it and you come back and you're into this place that we live in our country. And even with all the supposed shortages of things that we're experiencing now, it's moments like that that can change how you think and how you look at the people around you. Because I think there's a tendency in our lives at times to go in and it's like, hey, I want to be served in this moment. That community didn't approach it that way. 
They could have looked at it and said, hey, these people are coming in. They're giving us a well. Aren't we fortunate and aren't we blessed? No, they turned the tables. They flipped the script and they served us so incredibly well. It literally blew you away. They literally didn't hardly have anything. And yet they were there serving incredibly so. Which makes us take a step back, especially with the season that we find ourselves in today in 2020, in the middle of this pandemic. There's a lot of responses that we're bringing to our lives that really is not about serving others. It's about being served, the stockpiling, the the anxiousness and the responses that people have and a lot of the finger pointing that we see going on that's out there. There's a profound difference, obviously, between those circumstances in El Salvador and what we're experiencing here today in the U.S. But that attitude, I think, is one that we have to be careful of. That attitude of, I want to be served. And that's one of the things that really kind of drives us in our lives all the time. It's sort of a built into us, into our DNA of humanity. We love things to be about us. And in this time that we're in right now, we want to have quick answers. We expect solutions. We deserve responses to our questions. We think that the government should step in and do things quicker and faster and better. That really is what it means to be served. And when that's the script that we begin following in our lives... It really can take us down a path that can work us up inside. That me first mentality really pervades our society. I don't know about you, but I've seen it come out at different points in times over the last few weeks. People gathering up and hoarding supplies that says take one and they're taking a bunch. Or people making sure that you know if there's a line that the line starts back there before you even walk up to the front. We see people really kind of trying to focus a lot on themselves. I don't know what you, but have any of you encountered that or seen that over the last few weeks? Now, is this everybody? Absolutely not. There's been plenty of examples that I've seen of people responding just the opposite. They're not trying to be served. They're actually doing some good for the people around them. But there's just something in us that just can't help but want to be served. We want to be served first in our relationships because when you serve me, then I'll think about serving you. And I want to be served first and and recognized at work for all the things that I do. And if if you recognize my contribution, then maybe I'll go a little bit beyond and, and give some extra effort. Or I want to be served maybe for the recognition of that post that I put out there and, and why aren't people responding to me. All of those things kind of create this sort of me first mentality. And if those things begin to happen, then I need to really reconsider and rethink how I'm approaching the script that I'm following in my life because this problem plagues us. This problem plagues us and it has an impact on the people around us. It really kind of means that if we act this way in terms of serving first and we want to be served first, then the people around us ultimately suffer from us. The way that we talk to them, the way that we treat them, the way that we interact with them. I mean, people become a little bit less than, and we think we're a little bit more. And that mentality never leads us to good places. Because honestly, who doesn't love to be served? I mean, we all do. It makes us feel special. It makes us feel like we're entitled. It makes us feel good. It sort of feeds our ego when people are serving us. But that fuels this selfishness inside of us. And the more that selfishness grows, the more detrimental, I treat the people around me. I think that's the danger of this being served mentality has, if that's the script that we follow in our lives. And sometimes there are moments that we experience something cut through it to kind of shatter that being served mentality. That's why I'll never forget going to El Salvador. It's moments like when I was in El Salvador, that helps you cut through those wrong scripts that begin to play in our lives that remind us that that whole be served mentality isn't really what matters. It's not important. It's really damaging when we act out of that wrong script to the people around us. And sometimes moments are brought to us that can help us confront those selfish ideas and that selfish mentality that can affect us and plague us. And we have the opportunity in moments like this, when we're confronted with a complete change to how we're living, it's an opportunity for us to look inside and to just think through about how can I build off of what we talked on last week and that there is a builder that wants to shape who we are and who we're becoming. And he wants to make sure 
in the story that we're going to look at today just how being served is not the goal, the desire, the impact. The real impact comes when we flip that script in a totally different direction and we are serving the people around us. See, we get a certain amount of joy when we're served. When we're being served by other people, there's a certain amount of joy that comes from us where we feel good from it. But when you're actually serving other people, that joy isn't limited anymore. That joy becomes exponential and big. It literally takes the lid completely off and we are flooded in our souls with this excitement that is just unbounding when we have the ability to help those and love those and serve those around us. And it's why we need to flip the script today on being served. See, we need to see how God calls us to look toward others, recognize others, and it's encourage them by the way that we treat them, interact with them, and serve them. Now, this isn't our natural response, but it is when we choose to follow God's script for our lives. Now, we're going to take a look at a story today. A story of Jesus that is so radical in changing the perceptions that his followers had of him. They were thinking one thing, Jesus had a totally different plan, but he had this encounter with them and this act that he did for them that began to radically adjust what they wanted in terms of being served by Jesus, and he totally took them in a different direction, one that defied social standing, one that wasn't befitting of a man of Jesus' stature, but it set the tone for what would become of the church and the years and the centuries and the millennia to come. So Thrive, you're at home, you're watching, you're ready. If you're new, I'm going to tell you about something so you can do it with us. We love the Word of God here at Thrive. And I want to invite you in a moment to open up your Bibles. And when we do, we celebrate it and we cheer. And we're like, woo, because it's that powerful and important to us. So Thrive, are you ready? Let's open up your Bibles. Woo! That's what this is all about. Go with me, if you would, to the book of John. John chapter 13. We're going to be in verse 1. We're going to read through verses 4 through 9, and then 12 through 15. An incredible story, an act of Jesus that reminds us that we need to change this script that we play in our lives. Let's read together, starting in verse 1. It says, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. This passage right here actually takes place about the time that we're celebrating in our culture. Today is Palm Sunday. We celebrate Good Friday and Easter next weekend, and this story actually comes in the next couple of days. Palm Sunday celebrates the triumphal entry of Jesus coming back into Jerusalem where people were excited. They thought he was going to be their coming king. They wanted to put him on a throne because they thought he was going to usher in this whole new political rule and, and, and offer this war influence of knocking out the Romans, and yet that perception of where people wanted him to be and how he, they were going to be served by Jesus, he began to change. And so in this moment, though, he had to switch what was going on and put him in a new direction. This is what it says, picking up in verse 4. It says, so we got up from the table. The Passover was a meal that they would gather together to celebrate. Gets up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And in verse 12, it continues, it says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that is what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. It's quite a scene that night. Quite a turn of events to flip the script completely on what the disciples were thinking. 
In this moment, if you go back up, they'd followed Jesus for years. They had seen the most incredible supernatural things taking place. And so when Palm Sunday happens, they saw the future of what was going to take place in their minds about who Jesus was. He would be a military and political leader. He would become their king. And yet, Jesus, because he had a plan when he came to earth, he had a purpose of why he was coming here, he wanted to show them that they had no real idea what this was all about. They were trying to wrap their minds around everything, and yet this passage tells us so profoundly that his hour, his plan was coming to be. But he needed to show them a few more things still. And what we see right here in chapter 13 was really the beginning of a series of time that Jesus was going to just invest in and teach and share with his followers what truly matters to him and why Jesus came here to this earth. And so they gather for this meal, the Passover meal. This was one of the most sacred moments in Jewish religion. They were looking back on one of the times that God was most prominent in their history, and they celebrated it. And so they would come, they would gather around a table, And Jesus was going to use this to flip the script on what it really means to follow him. So as they sat down to the meal, there'd be a table typically that would be there. The meal would be prepared. There'd be some servants around and they would come in. There'd be pillows around the table. And it's not like a table like we have in our dining rooms today or in our kitchens where there's chairs and we have the place settings and all the silverware. No, there'd be pillows. They'd lay down and actually recline, laying down on the floor towards the table, usually facing the head of the table, which would have been the person of honor, which would have been Jesus, with their feet out behind them, laying down. And at some point in the meal, a servant would come up and wash their feet. He would wash the feet of everyone in attendance. And what's interesting is this was the job that no servant even wanted to have. Because the servant that had to do this was usually the bottom of the, the, the rung. They were like the newbie uh, of all the servants. In fact, if there was a Gentile that was present, a Gentile servant, the Jews were like, hey, this is even beneath us. We want a non-Jew to actually be the one and go and wash their feet. Why? Because this is one of the dirtiest of jobs that they had out there. Mike Rowe would not even have wanted this gig. But the script gets turned on its head when Jesus grabs a towel. In the middle of this meal, as they're sitting there and this moment was about to take place, I'm sure Jesus, in one sense, had either told them ahead of time or waved off that servant. He gets up, he grabs a towel, grabs the basin, and he walks over and he just sits down behind the table and he grabs someone's feet, grabs a little bit of water and begins washing it. Can you imagine this scene? Everyone's kind of watching Jesus. He disappears. And then someone's like pulling their feet up going, what is going on? But I imagine it going dead silent. What is he doing? Jesus has done this kind of thing before, something we don't expect, something out of the ordinary. And yet this, we're talking pin drop quiet moment. No one knew what to say. Jesus washing someone's feet, this was not something befitting of someone of his place. It wasn't until Jesus comes to Peter that all of a sudden we get an insight into what's going on because Peter speaks really on behalf of what all the disciples at that point would have been thinking. They're like, Jesus, uh, excuse me, uh, this is beneath you. Uh, you don't need to be doing this. Like, we got people for this. There is somebody that we can go get. God, uh, Jesus, I know a guy. We'll get a guy. He'll come in here and he will take care of all of this for you. But Jesus stops and he goes, "Um, you don't understand what I'm doing, but one day you will. Peter couldn't keep his mouth shut. He, he didn't even stop at that point. He's going, Jesus, look, you can't do this at all. I don't want you doing this in any form or fashion. Can you stop, please? And I imagine him pulling his feet away, trying to force Jesus to stop. And it's then that Jesus speaks back and goes, if you want any part of belonging and being connected to me, then I'm washing your feet. Peter realizes that this isn't just some little thing that Jesus wants to do. This is actually something powerful, that there's a message, there's a teaching coming. So he responds with, I don't really get all of this, God, but if that's what you're thinking, then here's my hands, here's my head, here's my feet. Would you just take it and wash all of me then? Because that's what I want. I want to belong to you. I think it's here that Jesus really gives some clarity to the meaning of the exercise. 
We lose a little bit because it's just foreign to us on some level, but to the people at the time, this would have really radically altered their understanding of how we're to interact and to treat people. He goes, you've seen me wash your feet. Do the same for each other. Follow my example. Do as I have done for you. This whole exchange kind of eschews protocol and decorum in any sense. But but that's Jesus. He does an act that is literally born out of the heart of why he came to this earth. And that's simply love. He came here to show how much he loves and cares about not just his disciples, but for you and for me and for all of humanity. Verse 1, if you go back to it, says it all. It says he loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. I love how Christian author and pastor Max Lucado puts it. He says, hands that shape the stars now wash away filth. Fingers that formed mountains, now massage toes, and the one before whom all nations will one day kneel, now kneels before his disciples. Hours before his own death, Jesus' concern is singular. He wants his disciples to know how much he loves them. See, love was the motivator for this act. Love was the impetus for why he did what he was doing, and not just any love, but we're talking about a love that will get on its knees and the leader putting other people first in the process. That's a totally different kind of love. It's really what I call humble love, a love that's willing to put someone first in the process because you care about them so much, and that's So beautifully, Jesus describing who he is, why he came, and this moment that he has with the disciples. He's showing them how we are to love one another. See, humble love serves before getting served. Humble love serves. It always serves first before we even think about or concern ourselves with being served. I mean, this is a flip the script moment right here. The humility from one who had every right and standing to not have to display this chooses to do it. It's that important. It matters that much to our lives. See, humble doesn't try to be puffed up or act deserving. See, humble simply puts someone else first. It seeks your good and good to be done to you and to have an impact on you. Combine it with love and you have this most potent antidote to this self-serving mentality that can plague us so much in our lives and the scripts that we often fall into playing. Jesus is like, look, let's approach this completely differently. See, we don't like the whole idea of humble love though. Humble love, this idea of serving before being served, it's a little scary sometimes. It can be a little nerve-wracking because we start to think about, well, maybe somebody will walk all over us or we'll get passed by or we'll get stepped on or walked on or worked over. And we've all maybe had that happen to us before. And we don't like to be in that place, which is why this whole idea of we want to be served first comes from. And yet Jesus is going, the world changes, you change. The impact that we can have on the people around us changes We flip that completely upside down and go, wait a minute, humble love, a love for the people around us, for the concerns that we have for the people in our lives. When I serve them, before getting served, there's a huge impact that comes from that on the people, the relationships, the quality of what God invites us into, and the transforming power that has on us. See, the reason we don't like serving others sometimes is that humble love requires us to get down and dirty sometimes. It requires us to do things and put us in positions and places that are a little bit messy. Uh, They're not always squeaky clean and easy sometimes. And we love things to be squeaky clean and easy. We don't like complicated. And that's why this time that we find ourselves in right now, this whole humble love is needed more than ever because there's a lot of things that are complicated. But if we get down and dirty and follow the ways of Jesus, then it truly can radically change our world. This is a great moment for us to actually do that. See, but we're talking about Jesus washing feet here, and I want to think about that for a minute. I mean, have you actually seen people's feet? I mean, you, I mean, and not just see them, Jesus actually has to get down there and touch them. I mean, this is getting down on a whole different level with people. I mean, Jesus did create them, so I think he kind of knew what he was getting into a little bit, but sometimes 
Getting down and dirty on that level is a little challenging for us. We think it might be a little bit beneath us, but it might just be the very thing that is best for us. I remember back a number of years ago when I was at church in Michigan, we were building a new building. And we had gone through some value engineering on the project, and so we'd cut some of the things that we were going to do in our kitchen. Uh, we had a large commercial kitchen plan, and we kind of scrapped a big part of that. And as, when we were in the middle of the building project, we got a phone call from one of the people who attended the church. And this was a, a commercial property owner, and there was a business, uh, a Coney Island, that had gone and out of business. Uh, Coney Island, if you're from the Midwest, that makes total sense to you. It's kind of a greasy spoon joint. They would have hot dogs and chili on spaghetti. Yeah, it sounds totally weird, but just go with it. Uh, but we got a phone call from this business owner and said, hey, this company went out of business. I have a new tenant coming in, doesn't want anything. If you can get all that stuff out of there in the next week and a half, the church can have it all. Now, this wasn't a business that had been there for a long time. It was relatively new business that just didn't survive. And so all of a sudden, the, the senior pastor came to me and said, hey, I want you to go there, get all that stuff out of there, put it in storage, and then when we're ready to go into the building, we'll have some of those resources to kind of outfit our kitchen. So I'm like, absolutely, I'll do it. Totally changed my mind when I walked in that first day. All of a sudden, we're going through, and it's like, oh, the booze, the tables, let's dismantle all of that. Then we walked into the kitchen. And the smell of grease just assaulted my nose. It was incredible. And you start to have to clean. And you're not just cleaning, uh, you know, simple things. I mean, there's caked on grease that had been there for like a year. I'll just say this. There were a couple animals that had made their way there. And there was some food that had been left behind in the process. We're talking disgusting. I am covered from head to toe. And after that first couple of days, I had the thought when I was driving home from there one day, I'm like, why am I doing this? Surely there's somebody else that could be in there right now. Surely there's somebody who could do it better or faster. I'm not sure why I'm the guy that has to do this. You know what? There are other things that are better for my time. You start playing these scripts off in your head, and I'm literally going, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then when we get back there, and sure, there's people helping me in the process, but I didn't care. I was like, why am I here right now? And then I reminded myself after it was all done, you know what? I love the church. I love the power and potential and beauty of what God created when these people come together to encourage us to follow him. I love the church that much. And so I'm like, that's why I'm there. If it saves the church some money, sets us up for some future impact, then you know what? I will go back. Now, it took me a while to grow into that attitude, if I'm honest, but humble love requires us sometimes to get down and dirty in some places that we don't intend to be. Even if it is in a grease-filled place, Sometimes there'll be some people in your lives that you might have to get down and dirty with, kind of go through some things that maybe it's a little messy, but you might be the perfect person to love them in a way that you can introduce them to Jesus, to encourage them when they are so anxious. You could bring some peace and some comfort to them at a time when they desperately need it. I do it all over again. See, love will always take you to places that you wouldn't go naturally on your own. And Jesus was showing this because of the love that he had for his disciples. Now, before you think, well, sure, it's easy to love people that are easy to love, you have to go look at the rest of the story. If you read through the passage in your Bible app, if you're following along, you can see in verse 2 and in verse 3, and you see in the other places that it wasn't just the disciples that were there that were the ones on Jesus' side. There was actually one disciple that Jesus already knew was ultimately going to betray him. He's still there in the room at this point. Jesus would call him out and he would leave later on. But when this act of him going around and washing his feet, Jesus made his way. Jesus Iscariot was one of those people that was there. Jesus washes his feet too. So Jesus is literally willing to say, wait a minute. Humble love is even willing to serve those that are hard to love. Even people that are willing to betray you or have done that before, God goes, hey, I want you to remember that this matters because it doesn't just matter to them. It matters to this right here in us, to our souls and our hearts because when I'm humbly loving, that means I'm listening and I'm submitting and I'm following the script that God has for my life. It really is pushing the self-centered, being-served mentality out of the way. Keeps my heart open, responsive, and willing to impact people around us tells us that, you know what, ultimately people matter. 
See, that's the message of Jesus. All people matter, and they need to know this love that God has, that Jesus has for them. And it's why Jesus models that for his followers right here. Because it's especially in times like they were in and that we are in now that Jesus says, I want you to show humble love to the people in your life. He's like, hey, you need to be an example of humble love who serves first. We're the ones who are supposed to lead the way in this. The church is literally the ones that should be known for our capacity and our ability to love all the people around us, starting in your home, in your family, in the places you go. But even as the church at large, we're supposed to be an example of literally willing to get down and love people when they need it the most. Remember, this is John 13, 14. The verse that says, okay, you've, you ought to wash each other's feet And I love verse 15, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done for you. I imagine the disciples hearing this verse would have thought of the example of Jesus on his knees, humbly bowing before them and washing their feet in in the role of a servant. But I also would think of them in a few days, what we'll remember on Good Friday when Jesus was literally willing to go to his death to show you just how much he loves you. See, he was willing to lead by example himself. He was the one who went first. And so all of those followers and all of those disciples, Peter, James, John, they're literally looking on and they would look back on this and go, hey, remember, we're supposed to love each other this way. We're supposed to love our world this way. It matters that much. And so for us, we have this chance to show the world some incredible love right now. So ways to love serves first. I want to remind us of some things that we can do and we can be expected to kind of have an impact on those around us. One is go without so others can have. Go without so others can have. In this age where there's a lot of things that people are going, hey, I need to make sure that I have enough for me or I have enough for my family, changing that mentality and going, hey, if I have a chance or I have the opportunity, maybe I'll just not get anything right now. I don't need to have any of that right now. So I want to make sure that other people can have it. I saw this in the grocery store the other day. It was a couple of weeks ago. We were walking in. Sally and I needed a couple of just basic things. It was in the morning. And we were getting low on toilet paper. I know everybody loves talking about toilet paper right now. It's like the new national currency. But we were getting low. Family of five, three girls, we were in need. I'm just saying. So we walked to the back, and I just went to go check out and to see what's going on. Fortunately, the, one of the workers was actually pulling out a brand new big pallet full of toilet paper. I'm like, my lucky day. As I come walking up, I'm standing in the waiting. There was an elderly gentleman who walked up next to me. He and I started chatting just about things. We had kind of a similar understanding. He was talking about bottled water and, hey, do people not realize that we have a faucet in our house? We had a chuckle over that. It was pretty good. He was already holding a package of toilet paper in his hands, and he told me a story. He said, hey, I was in here a little earlier, came down the aisle because my wife and I were older. We're trying to get a couple things because we just want to try to stay home because of just the risks to us. He goes, but I walked down the aisle. There was none to be had. It was all gone. He goes, and there was a woman who was walking out of there, and she had just two packages in her basket. And she stopped, and she looked at me, and she said, hey, do you need some toilet paper? She goes, yeah, I do. He literally hands the toilet paper to him. So now here he is, literally going, I want to grab a pack so I can take this one back to her so she can have it. She was willing to go without so others could have in that moment. I think God's trying to help remind us of that very thing that we need in our lives There might be an opportunity that you have this week to actually live this out. Another way that we can love, show people how love serves first, is to reach out and give time. Here's the thing that I know right now. We have time. Every single one of us has more time than we used to have. And we have an opportunity, though, in terms of what we do with it. As we're more isolated and separated, even though we can connect through technology in, in profound and incredible ways, We still have to take the initiative, maybe humble ourselves and reach out to somebody that you you kind of been pushing away or keeping at an arm's length. But instead, this could be a moment that you could actually reach out to them and give them the most valuable thing that you have, and that's the time. I called my brother this week. He and I are in a place where just trying to navigate through some things and 
uh, don't always talk, but I was like, hey, I need to give him a shout. And so I was able to give him a call. We had this great conversation and just listening to what was going on in his life and the struggles of what he's trying to navigate through. And we were able to connect over that in a big way. Reaching out and doing that for someone is powerful. I heard another story of actually one of our leaders here, uh, Al Grunin, who's doing some great things with our Echo Prayer app. And he's really helping kind of lead our, our direct connect project with calling everybody. Um, he was doing some stuff with small groups and he reached out to Pastor Nathan. And uh, in, the comfort, in, the, in the midst of that conversation, uh, they were talking like business stuff and some things he had done. Then he switched over and he just was encouraging said, hey man, I just want to let you know about the job that you're doing and the impact that you're having and I pray with you. And it was just in a great moment of just some time that he invested out of the life that he has and the job that he's still trying to navigate through and some of the other things he's doing. I just want to challenge you to take time. Humble love will always make it. We'll give of the time that we have. And the last one is to share what you have when you know someone doesn't. I'm going to challenge you this week if you listen for a story of someone and see how you can respond. Another one of those direct connect things that we had going on in our lives. Uh, one of our people was calling. They talked to a family, and they didn't have any flour, and they had some kids they liked to bake. Uh, and Terry, who was on the call reaching out to this Thrive family, uh, didn't just go over there and just say, oh, that's nice, you know, we'll see how it works. She took, like, flour and some other yeast and some recipes and said, hey, this would be a great project thing you can do with your family and with your, your daughter who loves to do this. An incredible moment to go, hey, she had some, a family didn't, and she was able to just humbly go, I'll take my time and I'll love and I'll share what I have with someone who doesn't. Gosh, it makes my heart smile when these things happen. Guess what? I know it makes your smile too. And then when we get to be a part of doing this, that just makes our joy go to a whole different level. And I don't know about you, but we need to experience some joy in our lives. We can get so caught up on the wrong scripts of all the things that we do, and that's a me first mentality. That's a be served mentality. But when we flip that script and say, Jesus, I am going to humbly love and I'm going to serve those before being served myself. See, that's the heart of Christianity heart of why Jesus came. It was all born out of that humble love that he has for us, for you, and for me. And you might need to just experience a little bit of that love right now. I want to pray for us and just say, God, would you just move in us and remind us of that love that you have? Because when we're reminded of the love of what Jesus has done for us through the cross, and what we're going to remember later this week and that he died for us, it really is compelling to want us to change. And say, God, I want to make sure that I'm following the script that you have for my life. Some of you might need to flip that script and choose to follow that path with Jesus today. It starts by going, God, I'm going to serve and follow you in the path that you lay out for my life. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we wanted to say thank you today. Thank you for the love that you have for us. A love that was willing to get on its knees and wash the disciples' feet. A love that was willing to humble itself. God, not just be a servant, but then go to a cross and die a criminal's death to show us how incredibly loved we are. God, that example is what you want us to follow because it radically can get into our hearts and remind us that when I look to my own interests first, instead of others it's not the script that you wanted to tell through my life or through any of humanity's lives God instead you want us to make sure that we're serving and we're loving those around us which requires us to humble ourselves and that humble heart God starts with us humbling ourselves before you saying Jesus I'm going to look to you first I'm going to trust you first I'm going to walk with you first God, when I can love you in that way, then I'm going to turn and I'm going to make sure that I humbly love those around me and serve before being served. So God, I pray somebody today might just go, hey, I want to put my trust in a Jesus that loves me that much, that is willing to sacrifice that much for me. I pray that somebody would go, God, today is the day. Jesus, I want to follow you and I will trust you with my life.
God, a simple prayer is just the beginning of what you can do in our hearts when we start to believe who you really are. And I pray that somebody chooses to make that decision to follow you today. And then, God, when we make that decision, I pray that we would have the courage to actually act it out. And so the ways that we're called to humbly love and serve, that we would change take the opportunity to speak when they come and they will come to love those in our homes to love those in our workplaces God to love those that maybe have let us down pray God that you would never let us forget what love really looks like so give you thanks we have a song that we just want you to sing along with us today kind of wrap up to remind us of this incredible humble love that Jesus has for us. This love that seems reckless on the surface, but it truly is the extravagant humble love that God has for us. She uses this time to pray and say, God, thank you for who you are and what you've done for me. Let's sing along together.
Now, one of the things we do when we wrap up on Sundays at Thrive is we get out our Connect card. So I want to challenge you today, if you can go in and you click on the Bible app, as you were, ta- as we were talking about earlier in the service, you click it on it, you find the events, and you go to it, and it says Thrive. Right there at the top, there's an online Connect card. I want you to click on that link, fill out the information. If you're new, new to our stream, and new, you've never actually been to our location, uh, we want you to just say, hey, I'm new today. We'd love to just reach out and say that we're glad you're with us. See how we can encourage you in any way we can. But we ask everybody to fill one out, whether this is your first time watching or you've been watching with Thrive a long time. Fill it out. Put the information on there because we pray over these cards. And I want to challenge you to actually write down there in the little section and say, hey, what is it that you felt like God was speaking to you today? But how you can humbly love and serve those before being served. Because that's what humble love does. So write that down in the connect card. Take a moment to put that information in there. And as you're doing that, right above that, there's another link in the app that actually is a link to help you give. Now, I know that as things are radically changing around us, sometimes you might find yourself in a place where things are impacting you in your life. But I just want to remind you that God is here and he will provide for you. I know at times when things have changed in my life, when I've had to wonder, do we have enough or what's going on? One thing I never stopped doing with whatever I brought in is say, God, we want to just give to you because we want to say thank you because you'll take care of us and provide for us. So there's a couple of different ways that you can give. There's a link in there that's online that you can click on. It'll take you to our webpage. You can fill the information out. You can also text in a, uh, an amount to 84321, select Thrive Church, California. You can actually mail something into our address here in our building and we'll get it. We are thankful for the people who are continuing to give because God is still using our church to impact other people. I even told you a couple of stories today. There's more things that we have that are coming that we can't wait to share with you. So thank you for filling out the connect card. Thank you for your generosity and help support what God wants to do in and through our church. Now, today... We talked about how we are supposed to humble love, humbly love, and humble love serves. Next weekend, we have truly a day that is everything to Christianity. We get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and Easter, and we have an incredible morning plan. We just want to encourage you this week, if you would, to make it a priority. Invite somebody else to come with you in terms of watching along with you and say, hey, we've got this great thing planned that you don't want to miss. We've got some really fun kids things that we can't wait to share with you later this week. So we're thankful that you're with us. Thank you for watching our online service at Thrive. We just pray that God will continue to sustain, provide, give you his peace. We love you that much. Let's take that love now and let's show it to our world. So God bless you, everybody. Thanks for being with us today as a part of Thrive's online service.